might be useful. Okay, you're on, guys. Now that's my red light flashing. The red light yeah. flashing. Okay, that means we're recording. Oh, okay, do you, you want to like. do an introduction at all on this thing or not? No, you know? well, you can do it if you like, but no, we're just, I don't no, this think is we'd the, the idea it. behind this, of course, that we'd like to get some uh, reflections by prominent people in the field on their, uh, some of the early days of study abroad, about which we know, many of us know very little. And uh, so the idea behind this taping is to, uh, is to uh, discuss with Lily von Klemper some of her reflections on her early days in the field. Now, how did you get involved with this to begin with? What, you know, what no, prompted you to get into the field at all? Uh, well, I got into it because I'd lived in England all during the war. And I had a very interesting job there. I worked with uh, sending books and educational matters through the British Red Cross to British prisoners of war in German and Italian prisoner of war camps. So when I came to this country, I was very interested in these educational pursuits. And uh, I have a brother who is teaching and who told me he knew someone at the Institute of International Education. So I went to the Institute of International Education, where there was a lot of goodwill and a lot of disorder. And I was told that they were looking for someone in the library. So I went to the library. And there I discovered that someone else had been hired. I was hired too. There we sat in a library. The library may have been fairly updated somewhat. It wasn't at this point. It was, however, used by people. So in looking around and wanting to write a letter to someone, I had to find my desk. I had to find my typewriter, and usually under some hat or something. The typewriter reappeared. So I, I just mentioned this because we started in a very, very a, primitive fashion. On the proverbial shoestring. Exactly. And did, was, this was when? I was right after the war. And that was in 1948. Uh, the Institute at this point had some excellent people working there. They were, you see, they were founded by three venerable professors in 1919. Mm -hmm. One was Dr. Stephen Dutton, who became our director, I think they called it. The second was Sir Nicholas Butler, Murray Butler, and the third, I can't find, I've forgotten to, but it'll come back to me. And these were professors who had been in Europe and had brought their German wives back. And they wanted to make the world a better one. I think it was a very legitimate effort. Did you did you get involved, uh, or did you, I know that it was right after the war when you came over, you came over from Britain, but did you uh, talk to people who were involved in, in study abroad even even before the war, which you know, that is before the Second World War, which is sort of a watershed situation in study abroad. Uh, and I mean, the big impetus for study abroad came after the war. Before that, now, th at least the, the, the popular theory goes that before that, we were dealing in large part with finishing school type situations, you know, a lot of that was a strand that was... Uh, as long as you don't call it finishing school work, well, that's now, what mostly yes. happened. Yeah, okay. And I mean, that's happened in Switzerland, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, the finishing school had a very well, a modest um, uh, situation at a time when young ladies just didn't travel alone. I read, for example, that uh, the university, American University Union, which was supported by Carnegie and administered by the IIE must have functioned before the First World War. It is not very well expressed. Mm. Uh, there was a tendency even at that time of not giving dates, writing whole books about an organization but omitting the date. And this university union was there for the uh, purpose of uh, writing letters of introductions to Americans who went to France. Mm. England, Rome was a third center, uh, helping professors find positions and lectures, and being there to uh, find housing to facilitate the uh, uh, situation of uh, American students abroad. So there must have been, at that time, before the First World War, a large number. Large numbers, yeah. Uh, Marymount indicates they stood up in every junior year meeting we had, Council of the Junior Year, that they were the oldest program. Mm. 
Now, yesterday, I still have to talk to, uh, to Gloria about it. She said the first group went over in 1924. Mm. However, Delaware, the oldest program we knew of, which became Sweetbriar College, was listed as 1923. So, but that was about the earliest I could find of an organized group. And so it's very, it's very patchy. I, as a matter of fact, uh, Jan may want to go and read uh, certain things in the, uh, at the IIE and particularly look for the bound annual reports. And uh, I think I also would have a list to, uh, to give her. There are quite a few interesting things written. The Fulbright is only, we talked so much about it that I put the figure down, only came in at 46. Seems a jolly long time. Now, if you talk to anybody, they will tell you not Junior here, but they will tell you all Fulbright. Yes, yes. Uh, the IIE around 1919 dealt a lot with, but it's more sending, bringing students to this country, uh, French students, then in 1922, Czech students, large numbers of some Americans went, because the ideal at this time was still in a student exchange. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't like to call our movement or whatever you want to call it, Tom. I think it's not student exchange, because we always seem to think it was one by one. But right after the war, when you became personally involved, there still was very little activity, right? In, 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 in the broadest sense, I suppose. There was not that great amount of activity of what we call study abroad, that is, students uh, uh, going off to study for. I'm talking about more formal study, that is a year or, uh, I suppose, semester type study. Uh, In fact, then it was mostly years, year-long study. Abroad, it know. was mostly year-long, and I think it was mostly uh, self-propelled. Mm. I don't think we were, uh, we were asked for summer study. Mm. And there was a great deal, and the IIE was very instrumental in setting up summer programs. Uh -huh. But I think for the year they went on their own. They again went with letters of introduction, and, or they went to people who had been here before. I but you, when you got into this office there, at, uh, that, was a, that was a resource room, uh, office, right? And I, it was, mm -hmm. ours was, it was called the Information and Counseling Center. The counseling we had to, although I objected to the word counseling because I feel that takes trained people, it was called because there was Latin American money which was given for counseling. Oh, it's oh, nice. And so that stayed over until we finally forgot about that. Uh, I think your uh, question is well taken. I think that's where some research has to be done, mm -hmm. or something, some more reading has to be done to pull all this together. I know that I had a very busy time. At that time, we started being asked to help people set up junior years. Uh -huh. One of the early efforts was Stanford, and I had uh, more or less blindfolded uh, college presidents come in and said, give me the Stanford pattern. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you see, there was always some activity, and I would say that I was very uh, much employed. Then, of course, in the first year, we took over administering, you know, the Marine Jumper and the Marine Forty Nazis were the two first council on student travel ships. Oh, really? So, and we oh. administered that together with the Oslo Summer School, uh -huh. together with the four or five then British summer schools. Uh, we administered a Vienna Summer School. So all these things began to uh, to really get quite active when I guess I started in 47. 47. Well, it didn't take too long for, uh, apparently at least, for the the whole field to get kind of a bad name, really. I mean, when yeah. I first became involved myself. Yeah, but uh, then, of course, six popped. Well, yeah, well, things popped a lot. You're right, in the, in, I suppose, in the in, in, in the 50s, right? I mean, suddenly there was this... Uh, yeah. When did you have it visit? Well... Because I do remember that visit. So I, guess, I guess the earliest visit wasn't until uh, probably... Uh, Probably the mid '60s, really. Yeah. I'm guessing, yeah. But uh, was it '60s? Yes, later, later, oh, late. late yeah. See, I left the I in '67. Yeah, I think this is about. Yeah, it must have been. We first met yeah. in maybe early mid '60s, yeah. early to mid '60s, because yeah. you weren't at IIE that long after I knew you. But the point was that when I got into the field, I know it had a great uh, program attached to it because there was this 
in the phrase rapid proliferation of programs during the 50s. And, and, and quality control was very low. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a period you, you lived through all this and, uh, you know, the, some it, dramatic it, conferences that took place. You know, I guess the one yeah. that you mentioned, we talked about earlier. Yeah, about polio. About polio. Was that was 1960, I guess. And, uh, yeah, this was an interesting. i tell you one thing. What you're touching on is very true. Uh, a problem which we still haven't solved, mm -hmm. trying to maintain quality. And at this point, we didn't have, let me say, the awareness we now have of our having made peace with certain situations. I, I mean, in former times, I used to talk, this is the best program, this is a good program, this is a bad program. I mean, now we've all learned to say this is a good program for that student. This is a bad program, which one shouldn't go. I mean, we make distinctions there. Mm -hmm. But that started, of course, with a junior year. You see, the junior year had a council on the junior year. I was a secretary for many years. And that brought together the very careful groups, Sweet Briar, who had their own meeting the very same day. And there were long discussions. I remember I had a very uh, it was a very touchy period when we had to fight out. We wanted one junior here in Germany, mm -hmm. and there were two contenders. Wayne won over Kansas. Uh -huh. And that way, all six, you know, we, we tried to say, well, there is no reason to have two immediately. Or well, Mr. Bursel from Kansas said there must be uh, us. And so these are the kind of things we, should, we started doing, I would say. And they, uh, well, the, the thing is, these, these schools all wanted to have, uh, I mean, it, it got much worse later, wanted to have their own programs, right? I mean, that was the idea. And, and, and the, you know, on one level, there's always been this drive, and, I, and, I, and, and it certainly came out in that uh, Mount Holyoke conference, and it's something that I know Steve, Stephen Freeman used to, still does talk about, I assume, that is that there shouldn't be lots of programs, but really it should be somehow centralized. And that's what you're yeah. talking about this is early on, right? But well, I mean, obviously, there are many programs in Germany now. And, uh, well, the, the next step, that is right, you see, the next step then became that the council on Zufel got into it mm -hmm. and arranged for meetings that they're doing it again now, which is very good, meeting of all the German directors, meeting of all the French directors. Uh, my problem when I've been abroad, and you must have had the same, Wherever I went, I had to introduce neighbors to neighbors who did the same work mm -hmm. uh, in London or anywhere. They didn't know each other. They didn't want to know each other. So that actually we were trying to coordinate uh, people who just, this kind of public relation angle of sharing and growing together. Anyway, uh, all these schools started setting up these programs. They all were uh, interested in, uh, in sending over um, students at the undergraduate level. And they all ended up uh, sending students at the junior year level. I mean, called, we always call the junior year abroad. Yeah. And, you know, why is it, why, why did the junior year? Was, this, was there a discussion in the earlier days, but did that seem to be the right time to go, or was there, uh, there official issues involved in it and so forth? Uh, these were the days where people were still admitting that they believed in two years of college is the equivalent to the abitur uh -huh. and to the matur. So if a student can, goes earlier and goes to the university, it's not university material, uh, the IIE made a very strong bid at this time, it was before my time, but I read up on it, that uh, an undergraduate does not belong to a foreign university. He should get his national education first. And then since, apparently, there was a great deal of pressure, he said, all right, but it has to be at an organized student. I think that's, that's yeah, quite no, that, that sounds, yeah, and the other thing that interests me is that, uh, looking long range now at the, the issue, in the, again, this is my, my perspective, in the early, early days, uh, the, there was a dominance of language-based programs overseas. In other words, and these programs and all the study abroad was dominated by language teachers, Stephen Freeman, a language teacher, for instance, and their, their uh, prescriptions even about the, uh, how things should be done in study abroad were largely based on students going over to study. This is not true in language-based programs in universities. You know, 
I think it's still true to a certain extent. And that some, with the exception of British programs where you know the language and can study every field, I think that uh, the non language study places, other than, let me say, the arts, are still not as extensive as people may want uh, you to believe. Um, the rigorous systems, the way they were, I certainly don't say they are now, if you think of the French problem, for example, we are such that an American student just couldn't benefit. Uh, they didn't realize that they had to take their notes in French, and that they had to be completely involved in it. So it seems to be that uh, the people stimulating study abroad are still mostly teachers of French and teachers of German. Tell me a little bit about when you, uh, I'm trying to picture this in my own mind, because there you are in this relatively small office, right? This, this intrigues me. I always think early yeah. days of all these things intrigue me, because I think of uh, the early days of IES, where they had four or five people sitting in the yeah. back room, and, yeah, you know, head uh, head you know and, uh, right cooking over one stove, and that's the program, you know, and of course that program became a huge uh, program over the years. And there you were in this uh, small office, obviously, yes. with, as you say, very small, the resources were not very, very good. How did you uh, manage uh, two things? One, to get an outreach right to to students and people around the country. Uh, did students? Uh, did you see many students actually physically come to see you? And uh, that, that that's sort of the two parts, I guess, of the same question, if you will. We got lots of students because the IIE had the prestige of advising students, and we got as soon as we all spent a little bit of time there, we got our own following of professors. And they sent their, stu they sent their students and they sent people, a uh, staff. I mean, I always hired outside the IE people who came to me through faithful people, Vassar and Nick Smith or so. Uh, students do, uh, did pour in because somehow it had gotten around. Then, of course, what we did as soon as we could uh, producing literature. I, for example, was very much impressed with French cultural services who brought out a five or six page saying the following university in France do this, scholarship, such. Well, I got permission and I copied them and I had eventually uh, five, I was showing to you sometimes sheets in a, with a nice cover with a map on it. When was and, that? When did, when was that um, I think that must have started in the early 50s, as soon as possible. The British had it, the French had it, and the Swiss had it. So I did not copy those, but I had all the other countries. And those things, of course, were relatively inexpensive, so you could keep them up to date. And hence, I'm still advising people, get your free material from agencies, because uh, they are able to review them more regularly. Now, the office grew, obviously, I mean, during yeah. this uh, period of time. Did your concerns change, do you think, during this period? I mean, initially, you were obviously involved in giving information, as yeah. you say. But but I know that by the time I met you, and this is, a, I know it's a 15-year period roughly involved, you were uh, you were noted as being kind of the, the, the person in the country who maintained standards. You were introduced to me in that fashion, that is, by people. Other people said, you know, that uh, Lily was the person who was really the person that kept the standards uh, high. It was one toe in prison. Well, you know, it was dangerous to a certain Well, it was to a certain extent. Yeah. You could have been sued, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did anybody ever try to sue you, you know? I mean, or the uh, IIE at the time for, We you know? never got quite that far. But they said, oh, no, this man was in Amsterdam. He was very dangerous. We were very frightened about him. Uh, because he called from Amsterdam? No, he called from a telephone booth. Uh, and then, how in New York, we were no longer frightened when he applied for a job at NAPSA. <laughs> 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 right after he was going to sue me and uh -huh. Archer and everybody. But when he applied for a job, we saw we, we He dropped the suit. He <laughs> might have dropped the suit. <laughs> but there were funny things happening there. Well, yeah, yeah, no, and the thing is that, uh, you know, I know that, you know, uh, actually, before we, we, we got on camera, that where you were saying that some of these. Uh, some of these stories, perhaps, were not, uh, you know, directly related to trends and so forth in study abroad, but they're interesting things. And the other, you know, you've heard me say at, at conferences, and we've done these things together, uh, that uh, uh, I'm overstating the case that, you know, study abroad is still the last refuge of the scoundrel, you know, in the, in the United States.
United States. It, and, uh, yeah. And uh, in the early days, there were you know lots of big wonderful characters. You know, at least it, 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 the way I view it now. This, uh, and you knew some of them, I'm sure. Oh, I knew them very well. Yeah. I mean, after they really, I would even go out to lunch with them. After we, <laughs> they really knew what I was saying. I mean, after they accepted the fact that I was blasting them. Yes. Uh, who am I uh, to invent standards? I have them, but I represent my organization. And You've done a lot of work in uh, uh, reading the literature study abroad. I think is a, is a, is the way it may best be expressed as how to read it, how to best interpret uh, the brochures and yeah. catalogs and so forth that come out from institutions. And is that, you know, it, it, is that a major issue that, that now truth in advertising really is what I suppose it's yeah. best uh, described as? Uh, is that to you a major issue yeah. still in study abroad? Or? Yeah, and that's what I ended up my little thing on uh, how to read. It seems to me that I have no right to say that must not exist and that cannot be done. But I want it, uh, I want it honestly done. Because then you have a chance to take it or to leave it. But it is embellished. Uh, what do you do then? Uh, as you look back on, uh, on, on your, your involvement in the field, uh, which is extensive, uh, and again, this is a broad question, but uh, if you would, how do you feel about your achievements? In other words, and it sounds a little self-serving, probably maybe talk about this, but in other words, if you were to say, you know, I, I achieved this and I achieved that, which would be the things you would point to in your, in your career that were, you know, high points for you? I would probably say, and I haven't thought much about it, that the fact that I can learn something new every day which falls on grounds on which I've worked very hard is my satisfaction. I know that it's all very personal. I know that I have, let me say, achieved perhaps in helping people, the getting clearer about their own aims. My greatest pride perhaps is that I've worked quite a lot with people who come more newly into the field and uh, have received awfully good positions and are extremely effective. I hope that I have contributed a little bit to well, the quality of Sikusa now, which was a very honest but fumbling effort to get into the picture. I think we're doing, you are doing all extremely well, and I think I take a tiny bit of uh, praise for that. But I think the most important thing also is that uh, I have tried, not always very successfully, in selling our efforts to the British, the Germans, the French, because we still have the great problems there that we don't think too much about us in terms of the American students. And I don't know whether you, if you honestly you think about some of your interviews, if you don't come to that yourself. You mean they don't think too highly of our uh, Not too highly of Americans. And I think that is an effort which we, as we go abroad and make, again, personal friends, have seen and approved. Don't you feel good about that yourself? I mean, I'd no, like I do. To I think there's, I think question. there's been some improvement in that area, but uh, I think it's still true. I think there's a bit of, a, a bit of a snobbery, if you will. You have to uh, conquer each individual uh, again and again and again. Well, most of these, you know, when you're talking about direct enrollment in university situations, that those types of programs are dealing with, you know, basically broad-based broad-based system here, right, educational system here, very yeah. narrowly, and rather elitist systems there, so it's it probably natural with some of this uh, snobbery, even antipathy sometimes, towards the American student shows up, even now. Well, yes, but then it goes into the opposite, which I object to more, and that is that they lower their standards for the Americans. That's what I find offensive. That certainly has happened. Yeah. That certainly has what do you what do you think? Uh, you know, what if you you know, got a crystal ball for a minute? You know, what's uh, <laughs> what? Do you, how do you see uh, study abroad developing uh, over, say, the next ten years? I mean, I don't know how far anybody can see ahead, actually. But uh, anyway, trends that you see uh, that are either you know uh, uh, trends in general, and whether they're good or bad in, in the field. I think it's come to stay, and I think it will grow, and I think it should grow. Um, our great problems is now the dollar and the pro 
proliferation. What about organizationally? Uh, maybe you're not interested in that, but I mean, do you think that Sakusa is, uh, you know, you mentioned before that it, uh, you thought it was a matter of, you know, one of the things you did that you're proud of was to help get uh, get Sakusa yeah. going, really. Hey, and, so. uh, yeah. I'll just throw one out. Uh, Sakusa become uh, uh, somehow much more involved in setting standards. Uh, yeah, I tell you, someone will have to set standards. At this particular point, if you pick up a Sakusa, a, a NASA publication, a CIEE publication, an IIE publication, you will find that they may talk about a good program, but the advertisements <laughs> are all from what we call the bad boys. Sikusa should have standards, uh, and Sikusa, I cannot say don't take a, a don't take an advertisement because they obviously need it. But it's very difficult for me. I've run quite a few of those workshops, which I love running. Uh, to uh, say one thing, and all they have to wave at me is the, the uh, publication which advertises the others. So it's very difficult. So, but I still think that Sakusa has a very important role as long as they recognize they can't ever afford to be a fully uh, equipped research organization. Sakusa uh, offices are no careers yet. Uh, they are, the people who are in the positions are usually excellent people, but they come and go by necessity. There's always need for 101. There's always need for no, nuts and bolts or the other way around. Uh, throw in a little bit of a thinking a panel or something interesting, but if it gets too uh, too, how should I say, too researchy, too erudite. I get complaints. You see, people come to me and say, shall I go to this conference? Can you read to me what is on? Well, some people just can't afford to give the money or send the money to uh, for a program which is way uh, beyond the head of the person they are sending because the person when she would be ready to receive is already in another job. So this is my, my very strong worry with the Sekusa. It's interesting, though, that what, what's being attempted is uh, by, uh, and you know this is what uh, uh, people like Joe Mestenhauser and others yeah. are very interested in, is a professionalizing, okay, yeah. the fields, that is, whether it's study abroad yeah. advising yeah. or foreign student advising. Yeah. Uh, and one of the ways uh, it appears to do this is to, is to make the organization more research oriented, and you would say that's a bad uh, thing. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I would say if we had enough money and enough opportunity for both, it would be fine. I don't want it done at the cost of uh, the, the young person who needs it. I mean, I've been spending lots of time, I'm hidden away beautifully here, but I'm spending lots of time on the conferences by sit, uh, standing around and having person after person come to me, so-and-so said I should talk to you. But these were all the basic questions which I enjoy answering. But where I think Sikusa can continue to do more. I don't know how 101 went this time. Last year I heard it didn't go so well. So that should be strengthened and that should be uh, not according to the whim of the person who's talking, but I think we should have some definite guidelines what should arise. Uh, I've always, for example, found it extremely important to remind people that they have neighbors and that sometimes by uh, clubbing together with three or four colleges in the neighborhood, they could share a lot, help each other a lot. And I think that's what I think is so important to foster. I rarely go to regional offices. I think that is a tremendous idea to have good regional offices. But don't give them too many speakers. Right now, Sakusa really is the only uh, professional outlet, right, for people in the field of study abroad. That is, and what, I mean, professional involvement that they can they can have primarily. Is that not true? I mean, uh, I don't see too many others. Well, I've, and uh, how? You no, know, this is a question that's plagued all of us. I think. How do people? Uh, how do we keep good people in the field? In other words, you you, you were saying it's true. I think. 
There's a lot of turnover. There's always a lot of new people. So that the function we have at any national conference or, or, or for Sagusa in general must be so well stated that it, it's really a teaching function, right? That's it is a strong teaching function. And but on the other side, what I'm saying is how do we, you know, keep, that's fine for the, for the newcomers, but how do we keep uh, others involved? Is this, you know, we've, we've argued this one, is this a discipline, is this a field, or is this just a group of jobs? I would say that it is, you know, those very embarrassing when I went to the early meetings of the Comparative Education Society, where they never got anywhere because they were still arguing that it should be a discipline of its own. Well, international law is not a discipline. Comparative law is not a discipline of its own. But comparative education wanted it a discipline of its own. So that it shouldn't be. But I think it should be, to a certain extent, uh, I would almost use the word a lobbying group. It seems to be uh, a good succession of letters to college presidents and to certain people relating to the needs of having international education well presented and provide them in addition to the fraud student advisors. There were now, there have been now for 10 years or so, and so many years, something called SACUSA. How that should be supported, and we are writing to them very early so that they possibly can have someone trained and ready to come to the next conference. You see, I would really go and go and go about it this way. So, as a lobbying group and as a as a teaching group, we're, yeah. we, we're doing okay. What in the last oh, I don't know, ten years or so, there have been uh, the formation outside of Sakusa of uh, groups of institutions getting together to discuss uh, study abroad uh, because primarily they found that they could not uh, have uh, open and uh, discussions about standards in programs within Sakusa or within NASA itself. Now, do you see that as a danger to Sakusa potentially, or is, is this just a natural thing that's going to happen continually? I see this as a downfall of the programs that get set up because they will learn eventually why Sakusa isn't do it, not doing it, or cannot do it. But there is still a too little coordination. I mean, I'm surprised that Middle State is going to have a meeting on study abroad next spring. Why? Their representative here from Middle, from Middle State, could they have fitted it in? Are we giving enough publicity? Are we forgotten by people? Do we have a representative of the American Council on Education do we, I think Sikusa should do perhaps a little bit more. More proselytizing about the yes, Iron Horn, Horn, good. No, I was thinking that's one side and that's very yeah. true because often people when they start to discuss study abroad, uh, you know, will ignore the people who uh, supposedly or supposedly were the experts in the field, that is those people that are, that are in Sikusa. But I think Sikusa should have the overhead role. If the CUSA plays it well, and we are having good people now, starting with a person sitting right next to me, I mean, it's, it's now a very different picture. But I think you are now, but perhaps the CUSA is not enough aware of your role. I have my only criticism, and I'm always very honest with you, has always been that you think too much in terms of titles and regional, regional meetings, and, uh, you know, you're, you're getting yourself a little bit too uh, rigorously organized. But I think that perhaps eventually Sikusa would uh, take on a little bit more, but not with a superior title and uh, a very strict meeting beforehand and afterwards where everything is so carefully discussed. I think you have to get a little bit more spontaneous. We're getting too bureaucratized, aren't uh, we? Yeah, yeah, but without, uh, if I, uh, sometimes I feel you're always playing a game. <laughs> I'm president, 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 you know. I think it's a... Uh, well, but on, but, okay, but on the other hand, uh, this is back to what I was saying. Just, you go back and forth on this, yeah. I think. Uh, people in the field do not often derive great satisfaction on campus from their jobs because the jobs aren't looked at uh, with any sort of, uh, yeah. you know, real respect. Uh, yeah. And so they need to get their respect from someplace else. So they turn to Sakusa, and there maybe they want to be, you know, field marshal or a czar. Now, one honor, you know, we have to mention uh, 
one honor that uh, people can aspire to now in this field will yeah. be the Lily von Klemper Award. Well, this uh, is a... Because it's going to be given, as you know, to you a little later on, and, uh, and then uh, thereafter, rather, in, in your name to somebody that uh, represents uh, the qualities that uh, you've been talking about, that uh, 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 contributions you've made to the field. And I well, think especially in bringing, bring, and I, it's certainly true of myself, bringing people along, you've certainly done that for me, and that is uh, uh, helping uh, people emerge, as it were, well, this, I think, is so important, and that is perhaps my major wish for the organization, to allow people to come along, I wouldn't even say to bring them along, but give them the opportunity to get along. But your work is with the colleges and universities. Thank you, Lord. Well, thank you.